Once again, welcome to the program. Let's begin in North Korea, where leader Kim Jong-un is rumored to be preparing for a visit to Russia this month to meet with President Vladimir Putin. A U.S. official says the two leaders intend to discuss the possibility of North Korea providing Moscow with weapons to support its war in Ukraine. It is coming after the White House said it had new information that arms negotiations between the two countries were actively advancing. According to U.S. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby, Russia's defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, has tried convincing Pyongyang to sell artillery ammunition to Russia during a recent visit to North Korea. He also called on the DPRK to cease its arms negotiations with Russia and abide by the public commitments that Pyongyang made not to provide or sell arms to Russia. Weapons that North Korea could be selling to Russia includes a Haosong intercontinental ballistic missile believed to be the country's first ICBM to use solid propellants. While well, checking on Russia in all of this, the government has said it has nothing to say about the report of a possible visit by the North Korean leader nor the discussion of the sale of weapons. The visit is of great concern to the United States, especially with the growing military ties between both countries. Just last week, the United States said it was concerned that arms negotiations between Russia and North Korea were advancing actively and that Russia defense minister had tried during the visit to North Korea to convince Pyongyang to sell artillery ammunition to Russia. But a Russian ambassador to North Korea, Alexandra Metsgora, has said that he is not aware of any plans for North Korea to participate in the trilateral military drills with China and with Russia, but that in his opinion it will be appropriate in light of U.S.-led exercises in that region. And reacting to news of a possible visit by North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin later this month, North Korea expert at Kunkin University in Seoul, Andrew Lankov, has said that this signals deeper ties between both countries as they face off with Washington. While he also thinks the North Korean leader will get some kind of economic assistance from Russia, and that the meeting is a signal to Washington that Russia is capable of creating some additional trouble for the United States in East Asia, which may or may not work. Personally, I would expect that Kim Jong-un's first trip after the COVID isolation period, which lasted for three years, would be to China. However, it's to Russia, which is a big diplomatic success for Russia. Kim Jong-un will try to get some kind of uh, economic assistance, politically motivated economic assistance from Russia. He, maybe he will get some promises, but I'm, I don't think he will get much of real stuff. Uh, because uh, for Russia, it's a rather marginal concern, and the economic situation in Russia is surprisingly good for a country fighting such a large scale war but still uh, still um, getting a bit difficult so probably uh, probably north koreans should not expect to get much aid and assistance but well a bit opportunity to make money by saying sending the workers overseas and maybe some limited military cooperation but what is important is a show it's largely about show Meanwhile, the head of international security program at Chatham House in London, Patricia Lewis, has said the visit is happening because Russia is not able to secure weaponry supplied by China. She suggests that Russia is not getting what it needs from China and has therefore looked to at other potential supplies of ammunition. I would imagine um, that it, it, solves, it, it serves several um, purposes. One will be the relationship between the two of them. Um, we had uh, the Defence Minister Shoigu going there and obviously talking about weapon supplies. But what I think North Korea wants is something in exchange for that. Um, obviously, it would like real high-tech uh, missile technology, etc. Um, it may also want a show of strength with Russia, such as 
military exercises, naval exercises, and so on. That may be part of the discussions. Um, what's, I think, very interesting from the perspective of um, the Russia's war against Ukraine is that Russia clearly is um, needing to offer something to North Korea um, to get ammunition. It's not just straightforward, just purchase. And I would say as well that what we have seen too is that they're not getting what they need from China, which I think is very interesting. So, you know, North Korean ammunition won't be of the highest quality. It was promised before, but it hasn't, not, not much has actually got through, it seems to Russian front lines, as from what I've been able to ascertain. So, um, you know, this is um, clearly Russia running short of our ammunition right now and having to go to North Korea. There are very few countries that they can go to to get this type of ammunition. Well, let's bring in security analyst Chidi Wanu to discuss even further. Hello, Mr. Wanu. Thank you very much for joining us on The World today. Good evening. Thank you for having me. And we know there is no surprise there about the visit. I mean, I guess the timing of it is also significant, isn't it? Well, I mean, if, if we want to look at it from, you know, the temporal point of view, where we are is uh, the Russians are fighting off the, the Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive. Now, this has been a very ammunition intensive encounter for them. They also have to prepare for the coming winter fighting season. Now, they have the option of either still being on the defensive or launching their own limited counteroffensive at the same time. Irrespective of this day, they're going to need to rebuild their ammunition stocks from what they used up over the summer and over um, the spring and the winter, and also prepare for next year's fighting season. So the timing is is more a matter of this is the rush. This is where the Russians need to start preparing for next year and you know preparing um, you know their resources for a much longer fight. But North Korea has been developing weapons. It didn't start today, despite the criticism from the West, selling even some of that to Russia. Do you think that this is a climax of a country's weapons program? Well, the, not necessarily, because what Russia is going to be looking for from North Korea is fairly low-tech um, weapon systems. So they're not going to be looking for ICBMs or any of the, you know, the big-ticket things that you see the North Koreans demonstrating. What North Korea holds... For Russia is the great is that they have a huge uh, arms industry and they're making Russian standard weapons or weapons within Russian uh, caliber so one two two one five two type artillery and they have a huge quantity of this you know one two two uh, rockets as well so they can supply this to Russia quite easily they don't need to make it they've got it in stock and the North Koreans have no particular scruples about who they sell weapons to which is fine and they also are in desperate need for foreign currency or any other sort of um, resource be it fuel, food, whatever it is. So it's a match, you know, made in heaven, as it were. They, the, the Russians need something the North Koreans want, and the, and the North Koreans will be able to extract, you know, whatever price they wish from uh, the Russians for it. But if there's someone really concerned, I mean, the U.S. is very worried about the types of weapons that North Korea will be selling to Russia and of this partnership between both countries, of course. But why should this be of concern to the United States, which already has superior weapons, some of which have been promised to Ukraine? Yes, so the weapons, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the weapons that uh, Russia, um, Russia will be getting from North Korea ones that you see the North Koreans demonstrating their ICBMs. The, the proliferation of that to a country like Russia is, is you know, is not necessary. It's, um, the Russians have their own ICBMs. The big worry from, you know, the U.S. perspective is that this, you know, one of their key um, strategies has been to, de you know, deplete Russian resources. So Russia now being able to source, you know, a fairly large amount of uh, ammunition from the North Koreans you know, defeats that strategy, and it means that the the Russians will be able to continue their their fight for quite a, a long time. The, the question will be, is it only ammunition that they're going to get from the North Koreans? If they start sourcing other things like, um, you know, rocket artillery pieces or um, tubed artillery pieces, that again gives the Russians a new lease of life in their uh, war against Ukraine. Also, I mean, what does this mean for Russia in all of this? Are they running out of weapons supply for the war in Ukraine? Or what could be going on here? Why do they need these weapons from uh, uh, Kim Jong-un? Well, it's, it's, it, will be, it will be incorrect to say they're running out of weapons. I think they've got sufficient weapons. They've got quite a lot of ammunition. They've got, you know, functional ammunition factories. But 
even in uh, a war such as this, you know, you you need to keep some ammunition in reserve. You need to keep some ammunition that you'll use for training. You need to keep some ammunition and some weapon systems in case of other contingencies. Russia is a huge country. It has many land borders. It borders China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and it has to keep some of its forces ready for any kind of conflict that might come up there. It has to keep its forces ready for a conflict that might erupt with NATO. So even if the Russia has a million shells now, it, you know, it You know, it needs to produce more shells to replace the ones it's using. It needs to keep some, you know, uh, stored away for any future conflict. So what you're seeing is Russia being pushed to the limits of what it can produce by itself and how much it has to use in Ukraine to, you know, um, fight this war. So as I said earlier, you know, part of the strategic objective has been to push, you know, uh, Russia to the limit of its resources. And that is what you're seeing happening now. Russia has reached a point where they can no longer produce enough ammunition to sustain their war effort. So they now need to go elsewhere. But North Korea obviously has an equally vast defense industry that can supply Russian weapons, you know, to the calibers that they need. I mean, but what does Ukraine have to... Um, should Ukraine be scared in all of this? I mean, with this visit between Putin and Kim Jong-un, what is it in there for Ukraine at the moment? So there, there were many factors in this. There are several people who should be worried. The first is, as you've mentioned, the Ukrainians, because... This the, part of the strategy has been, uh, you know, uh, during this counteroffensive has been a counter battery fight where they've been destroying Russian artillery quite significantly. Now, if the Russians, as I said if I, uh, earlier, if the Russians get additional artillery as well as artillery ammunition from the North Koreans, and that replaces some of their losses, but the fact that they're able to get just ammunition means they can sustain the fight as they as they have been doing. The other element is that in return for Russian uh, North Korean. Uh, aid to Russia. The Russians could also aid the North Koreans with other devices, such as the Garand drone that they got from um, Iran. Now, that would be that the North Koreans already have their own drones, which sometimes fly to South Korea, but they're not as, as prolific or as efficient as the Garand drone, which is a very cheap, you know, uh, long range platform. Now, if that's applied to the North Koreans, it, prevent, it presents another problem for the South Koreans and the, and the Americans. But from the uh, Ukrainian point of view, what this does is open up a, a tap for the Russians of ammunition for wi with which they can continue their war, with which they can continue fighting against the Ukrainian offensive. And when the time comes for the Russians to attempt their own offensive, they'll have sufficient resources to do that. So the big problem the Ukrainians are going to have now is to be is to how they're going to interdict any shipments coming in from North Korea. That's going to be quite difficult. But you're going to see the battle shift now uh, in terms of trying to defeat Russian logistics much deeper than uh, has been happening now. So are, they've been attacking as far in, uh, to Crimea and, you know, up into um, some of the bases, you know, to the, to the um, uh, east of Moscow. But you're going to see uh, attacks going deeper into Russia now to try and interdict any of these shipments. But we do not know when this meeting will hold. I mean, Russia has said it does not want to talk about this on this report of a visit between both leaders. Should there be a genuine concern about North Korea's involvement in a war like this one? I think the, the big concern is that it gives North Korea, which is a fairly impoverished state, it gives them a, a new source of income. And North Korea is not a country that necessarily uses its funds for the betterment of its own people. This will be going towards the Kim family and, you know, the ruling class around them. And it will be going to developing more weapon systems with which to threaten or blackmail um, South Korea and the Western powers. So there's a big problem there in that, you know, this is enabling, you know, a fairly dubious regime. But as I said, at the same time, it gives Russia the capability to continue prosecuting this war to the same level that it's been prosecuting, you know, uh, for the past year and a half, which is very problematic for the Ukrainians, who, whilst they have the resources of the West to fall back on, uh, are have been fighting, you know, for, as, as we've just said, for a year and a half, and it has taken quite a strain on not just their military uh, in terms of manpower, but also equipment. So it just, in essence, the, the summary is that this will prolong the war further, um, and it will increase, you know, the level of human suffering, both in the Koreas and also in Russia and Ukraine. All right. Thank you very much, Security Analyst Chidi Wanu. Thanks for your contribution on the world today. Thank you for your time.
Dozens of people may have been killed during days of clashes between a U.S.-backed Kurdish-led militia and Arab fighters in Syria. The fighting erupted after the Syrian Democratic Forces arrested the head of a tribal militia backed by Arab clans, with which worked with in the eastern province of Deir al-Zor. The unrest later spread north and west of Hasakir and Aleppo provinces, but the U.N. had received unconfirmed reports of 54 civilian deaths in those attacks. And coming up in just a moment on the world today, detained Myanmar leader Aung San Suu Kyi said to this ailing and a request for an outside position have been denied. We'll bring you the details. Please stay with us. Welcome back. A section of the Great Wall of China China was damaged recently after vandals looking to create a shot court uh, used an excavator to dig through it. Still photographs released by the UU County Public Security Bureau showed missing portions and a dirt load passing through a section of that wall located near Shizhou City. A statement released by local authorities say they were first alerted at the damage on August the 24th and then investigations revealed an excavator had been used. The statement adds that two suspects were detained for further questioning and they performed the excavation to save time and distance. Well, let's now turn our attention to the Asian summit being held in the Indonesian capital of Jakarta. But earlier today, President Joko Widodo kicked off the 43rd plenary with a call to the 10-member bloc to devise a long-term tactical strategy that is relevant and meets people's expectations. Myanmar is not attending this year's meeting because Asian banned by mil its military leaders from its high-level meeting. But difference, uh, have emerged, differences have emerged with Indonesia attempting to engage all sides to push an Asian plan of peace and Thailand trying to engage Myanmar's military leaders. Just last week, the leaders were held... Um, an East Asia Summit, a wider forum which includes China, India, Japan, Russia and the United States. And while the leaders deliberated a peace plan for Myanmar, detained former leader Aung San Suu Kyi said to be ailing and a request for an outside physician to see her has been denied by the country's military rulers. The 78-year-old Nobel laureate has been treated by a prison department doctor instead. The Southeast Asian country has been in turmoil since early 2021 when the military overthrew Suu Kyi's elected government and cracked down on opponents of military rule with thousands jailed or even killed. Aung San Suu Kyi is now facing 27 years of detention related to 19 criminal offences. She denies all the charges for which she was convicted, ranging from incitement and election fraud to corruption and has been appealing against them since. We turn our attention to weather events now. We begin in Asia, where Typhoon Haikui has caused flooded streets and water eruptions in the southeastern China city. And that's after storms from now weakening Typhoon Hakui made landfall. Strong currents of muddy water flowing around vehicles stranded on the streets of Yongtai County, located in the coastal province of Fujian. Several areas in Fujian recorded more than 300 millimeters of rainfall in just over 24 hours. The typhoon's long strength and became a tropical storm after its landfall around 5 a.m. The national forecaster reported that it was last reported to be moving over southern Guadong province. And forecasters are expecting it to continue to weaken as it moves. Oh, very tight. And uh, the climate summit, so let's talk about that now. It is holding in a Kenyan capital, Nairobi, where President William Ruto says that special drawing rights should be made available to the country that needs them most. Complaining that African countries pay five times as much interest in other as compared to other borrowers, he has called for multilateral financial institutions to increase concessional lending and for a conversation about the carbon tax to finance development. African officials are saying that meeting that the continent's financing needs will require a transformation of a global climate financial uh, architecture, particularly giving governments high debt guests. loads. Good morning. 
biggest contributor to debt distress in our continent is high interest rates. We pay five times more than others. Meaning that in fact, the architecture is set up in a manner that if you borrow, it will be difficult for you to pay. And that is why we need a conversation and a very candid conversation and we are saying this in all honesty around how do we get concessional funding? How do we pay as much as others are paying? How do we get Africa away from paying five times more? Potential and opportunity are both futuristic. We want a fair financial system that treats everybody equally. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is not too much to ask. A fair international financial architecture is not a fair proposition or an unfair proposition to make. And the most energized discourse in order to facilitate imaginative to be able to unlock the resources that we need to be able to drive these new investment and financing opportunities, especially for green energy. We believe it is time to have a conversation about carbon tax. I said we need to have a conversation about carbon tax. And I mean we need to have a conversation about carbon tax. Yes. We believe it is the only way, it is among the ways that we can raise additional and adequate resources for us to finance our development. Meanwhile, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has told delegates today that developed nations have to take responsibility for their role in rising global temperatures that have caused the climate crisis. He has called for an end on the use of fossil fuels, which are largely seen as drivers of global warming, which in Africa has resulted in flooding, droughts and erratic rainfall patterns. This continent accounts for less than 4% of global emissions, yet it suffers some of the worst effects of rising global temperatures. Extreme heat, ferocious floods, and tens of thousands dead from devastating droughts. The G20 countries, responsible for 80% of the emissions that we'll be meeting this week in Delhi, assume your responsibilities. Developed countries must commit to reaching net zero emissions as close as possible to 2040. And it's time to break our addiction to fossil fuels and invest in a just and equitable transition. We need to see credible plans to exit coal by 2030 for OECD countries and by 2040 for the rest of the world. Developed countries must present a clear and credible roadmap to double adaptation finance by 2025 as a first step towards devoting at least half of all climate finance to adaptation. And they must also keep their promise to provide 100 billion US dollars a year to developing countries for climate support and fully replenish the Green Climate Fund. And all countries must also operationalize the loss and damage fund proposed at COP28 this year. To other stories now, for the COP28 President Sultan al Jabor, the world is losing the race to meet climate change goals. He will preside over the climate summit in UAE in late November. Well, he announced the UAE is pledging 4.5 billion US dollars to develop 15 GW of clean power in Africa by the year 2030. Africa is currently having about 60 GWs of installed renewables capacity.
The world is losing the race to secure the goals of the Paris Agreement. And the world is struggling to keep 1.5 within reach. Collectively, we must admit that we are not delivering the results we need in the time we need them. The Abu Dhabi Fund for Development, Etihad, Credit Insurance, Mazdar, the Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company, and EMEA Power will join with Africa 50 as a strategic partner under the guidance of the UAE and African leadership to develop 15 gigawatt of clean power by 2030. Working together, we will deploy, and by working together, we will deploy 4.5 billion US dollars that will catalyze at least an additional 12.5 billion US dollars from multilateral public and private sources. This initiative is designed to work with Africa and for Africa. It will act as a scalable model that can and should be replicated. And it will support COP28's global goal of tripling renewable energy by 2030. And back to the weather now. Storm Daniel has been sweeping across western and central Greece since Monday this week, flooding homes and roads across the country. In the city of Volos, fast currents were captured on camera, gushing down rivers with high water levels, while cars could be seen attempting to navigate flooded streets. The fire brigade said earlier today that a man died after a wall collapsed in the bad weather. And according to Athens News Agency, the wall collapsed when the man, a cattle breeder, was trying to reach his animals. The storm landed just days after a deadly fire was brought under control in the north of the country. Well, let's bring in uh, London correspondent Juliana Olainka now to discuss more. Hello, Juliana. Thank you so much for joining us on The World Today. Hi, Anne. Hi, it's good to see you. <laughs> All right. So um, I don't see you sweating, even though they... Uh, I think, are you getting used to the heat in London or what's going on? I know it's very hot now. And it's all an illusion. I am definitely sweating. In fact, everybody is sweating in my house. We've got all of the windows open and um, the doors open because most people in the United Kingdom don't really have air conditioning. We don't because we only really get um, warm, nice weather for a couple of months in the year. And, you know, it is unseasonably hot at the moment. It is September. Um, we're expected to go into the autumn season. But, you know, the weather has been really, really high. High temperatures today of about 29 degrees, as to be expected. We've seen loads of pictures of Brits flocking to beaches in their bikinis and in their shorts, trying to get uh, the most of this late weather. Because um, unlike this time last year, uh, when we were seeing record-breaking temperatures of 40 degrees and wildfires in the east of the capital city. We didn't see that um, during August. There were a couple of weeks of summer in July, and then it was pretty cool. Um, so I think it is quite strange and alarming that we do have uh, these high temperatures in September. In fact, the Met Office are predicting that before Sunday, we could actually see the hottest day of the year. I think the hottest day of the year so far was in July. It reached about 32 degrees. It's expected um, to top that. So, yeah, so, you know, it depends how fortunate you are. If you are fortunate enough to be at the beach um, during um, the weekday um, with your bikini, it's great. But um, for a lot of people, it's quite uncomfortable. And it just goes to show um, that, you know, the climate is changing. And um, I think we've listened to some of those sound bites from the world leaders at the African Climate Summit, um, quite alarming, I must say. But what are weather forecasters saying about this period? I mean, before the weather begins to uh, be, get worse, what are they saying? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm of course not a meteorologist, 
Um, so I suppose I'm just kind of picking up uh, from, you know, what what I've read out there. But, um, you know, this is not unique to London. I think Paris is also experiencing some sort of extreme um, heat at the moment. Um, I believe this is coming from a Sahara dust plume. Uh, that's what the meteorologists are describing it. But again, um, we've just heard um, in that clip you were playing from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, um, that, you know, uh, the world is changing, the climate is changing, and it's triggering extreme weather, be it uh, wildfires that we've seen in places like Hawaii and in Canada, Canada, extreme heat in China, um, or devastating floods that we're seeing now in southern Europe. Just um, last month, we were talking about those devastating wildfires um, on the island of Rose, which is just off mainland uh, Greece, and how disruptive that was um, to terrorism. Um, so yes, of course, anybody can look at the daily weather um, and see what the forecast is. But I think it's so much bigger than that, isn't it? Um, Anne? Which is why, um, you know, world leaders are gathering and are trying to mitigate against it, whether you are a conspiracy theorist or a skeptic or somebody who believes scientists. Clearly, we're seeing that weather patterns are changing. And the fact that it's the 5th of September, you know, and it's going to be 32 degrees in London, um, you know, the capital of a very windy, cold island, it goes to show that perhaps the burning of fossil fuels has damaged our planet. Well, thankfully, Britain has not been affected by floods like I mean, other European countries are facing right now. Greece, Spain, Bulgaria, they have all been experiencing wildfires. Is it safe to say that it has been a good summer for London? Yes, um, you're absolutely right. It was it was quite cool, as I said, in um, the capital and in the United Kingdom this um, summer, um, in stark contrast to what we saw last uh, summer, where we had um, wildfires that we hadn't seen in this country in recorded history and the, the, the hottest um, uh, day on record. And just last month, we actually had the hottest day recorded on earth in recorded history. Um, that did trigger, as you said, wildfires in southern Europe. And what has come off the back of those extreme wildfires we saw is now extreme flooding um, and devastating um, rainstorms. As you said, it's taking place in Italy, in Malta, in Greece, um, and also Spain. I know that uh, experts there and um, officials have released uh, some weather-related warnings asking people to be uh, care for. And, you know, these are not just spectacular pictures that we see anytime we talk about extreme weather. You know, these devastate livelihoods, um, roads, uh, which was just coming off um, a COVID-19 pandemic recovery, um, is now got to pick up the pieces of what those devastating wildfires leave uh, behind. And just as they are trying to gather themselves together uh, from the devastating wildfires, we've now got this um, extreme flooding. So, yeah, pretty serious. It hasn't been uh, the best summer. But again, from China to California, you know, from Lagos to uh, Lahore, I think the entire world is seeing this. This is not unique uh, to Europe. Um, we were just playing um, those sound bites from that all important climate change summit in Kenya. And that's exactly what the leaders are talking about, you know, extreme um, weather. And this is um, the reality of it, um, you know, torrential rains and, um, you know, uh, very, very hot um, temperatures. Uh, Julian, I mean, one will wonder how much of a temperature cross between these European countries. I mean, you're talking about it not being uh, experiencing flood and all other things in the United Kingdom, other European countries are experiencing this. But has the weatherman given any update on maybe predictions for a fall or anything that is possible that might be happening in the United Kingdom? Yes, unfortunately, I'm not abreast of um, any weather uh, predictions for the rest of the year. I think the focus really now, um, Anne, is on what can be done to mitigate against some of these 
you know, circumstances. Um, are governments going to have to do um, emergency uh, worst case scenario planning, which is what uh, the British government had to do uh, when for the first time in history, um, parts of um, the capital city were burning due to extreme um, heat. Um, so I know that uh, senior government officials are, are having to kind of crack their heads together and understand, OK, you know, are we going to have to not build in particular areas? We do have areas in um, Middle England that are tend or prone to flooding uh, when we have extreme rainfall. And there are discussions about whether or not um, homes should be built in those areas. And I think going forward, uh, rather than looking at the day-to-day -day temperature, what government officials now need to do, particularly in Southern Europe, who are still struggling, you know, a lot of these nations that are being battered um, at the moment are not the wealthiest nations within um, the continent. So they would need to look at perhaps, um, you know, looking at other tourist um, spots that could be safer. Uh, but who knows? I think, you know, I'm not an environmentalist, but certainly I've been following uh, the climate emergency for several years now. And um, I think the, the, the wider discussion is that um, world leaders and heads of state now ratify the agreement they made in Paris in 2015. Uh, they don't just attend uh, climate um, days and summits that are happening in the continent at the moment and just take fantastic pictures for social media, they have got to act. They have got uh, to do whatever they can so they can protect, um, you know, their grandchildren and those who are not yet living on this planet. But we're the custodians, so we need to look after it. All right. Thank you very much, Juliana. Please keep yourself hydrated and, um, and stay safe. All right. Thanks for your contribution on the World's Day. Thank you, Anne. Let's talk about weather in Bulgaria. Two people have been killed in floods caused by torrential rain in the municipality of Sarevo in the Black Sea region. State of emergency has been declared and the media says that 60 people have been evacuated. Citizens are expected to hear from Prime Minister Nikolai Denkov on the situation and that will happen later today. Well, you heard us talk about floods in Spain over the weekend and on Monday. Citizens have been trying to clean up their homes and from the mud and the water. Reporters are able to follow one citizen into his home ravaged by muddy flood water. Carlos Maroto says that he was just lucky to have a top floor to protect him and his family from the torrents of water that cascaded into his home. Authorities are saying at least two people have died and three people are still missing as Record rainfall caused heavy flooding in central Spain. The rainfall, although still heavy in some places, was expected to wane later on Monday. The National Weather Agency on Monday lowered the alert level to yellow from orange and red on Sunday. We're still ahead on the world today. Disneyland Shanghai hoping to impress visitors at the Zootopia Land attraction. We'll bring you the details of this and more. Welcome back. The European Union has been working for months now to push for the release of a Swedish EU worker detained in Iran for the last 500 days, so says the bloc's top diplomat, Josep Borrell. Sweden and the European Commission on Monday said a Swedish national is being detained in Iran following a report in the New York Times. Borrell today confirmed the man in question is Johan Flodoros, who is described as a Swedish citizen who works for the European Union who has been detained illegally in Iran for the last 500 days. It's a Swedish citizen who worked for the European Union, has been detained illegally in Iran for the last 500 days. I want to stress that I personally, all my team, at all levels, European institutions, in close coordination with the Swedish authorities, which have the first responsibility of consular protection, and with his family, have been pushing the Iranian authorities to release him. Every time we had a diplomatic meeting at all levels, we have put the issue on the table. Relentlessly, we have been working for the freedom of Mr. Florerius. And we will continue doing that. 
in close contact with the family, respecting their will, and for sure with the Swedish presence, the Swedish government. This is very much in our agenda, in our heart, and we will not stop until Ferreros will be free. Well, India's capital, New Delhi, is a bustling metropolis of over 20 million people and a melting point for cultures. A mix of ancient and modern architecture, the city is littered with historical monuments ranging from the ancient Mughal period as well as ruins of past glory reflecting its thousands of year old legacy. The city comprises of old and new parts called Old, new, old Delhi and New Delhi, with New Delhi being built by the British when they shifted their capital from Calcutta to New Delhi during the colonial rule. As the capital of India since 1931, New Delhi carries the legacy of British colonial rule and the struggle for independence. That city is set to play host to world's most powerful leaders at the G20 summit this month. The showcase for Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the country's growing presence on the world stage. The two-day summit, starting September the 9th, will have the most high-profile guests list in India have ever welcomed, from U.S. President Joe Biden to British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and, of course, Saudi Arabia's Mohammed bin Salman. And finally on the program, Shanghai Disneyland has promised to impress visitors with its upcoming Zootopia Land attraction this season. Speaking to the media and guests at that event, President Joe Scott said the new attraction is scheduled to open by the end of this year and visitors can look forward to being wowed. Apart from the theme, Land's latest ride, visitors were also presented with a showcase of some of Zootopia-themed merchandise and food items like Hawthorne-flavored popsicles and, of course, mini donuts. Many guests expressed anticipation for the new themed Land, saying that they are huge fans of the 2016 Disney animation film. And on that beautiful note, we end the world today. For today, thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu.